the average person has very little knowledge of the criminal world, with the idea of informants, double crossings, and murder for profit all seeming like concepts more out of a movie than real life. However, for Scott Lee Kimball, this was the life he had forged for himself, and he was going to see it through until the bitter end. In today's video, we'll be diving into the wild world of an FBI informant trapped in a web of lies that eventually led to him becoming a serial killer. Scott Kimball was born in 1966 in Boulder, Colorado. His life began with a rough start, as his parents divorced at an early age when his mother came out as lesbian. Following this news, Scott's father left the family and remarried, leaving Scott and his older brother Brett to move in with their grandmother in her mobile home. While living here, Scott and his brother were both sexually assaulted by Theodore Payton, their grandmother's neighbor, whose disturbing abuse ranged from photographing Scott while he was naked to Theodore filming himself raping Scott. Scott felt helpless as Theodore threatened to kill Scott's dad if he said anything, leaving Scott at the mercy of this disgusting maniac. The near two decades of abuse finally came to an end when Scott attempted to take his own life at the age of 23. Seeing no other way out of this awful situation, Scott attempted to shoot himself. However, the bullet bounced off of his skull, sparing Scott's life but leaving him with a brutal wound and a large, noticeable scar on his forehead. Ed Coat, a cousin of Scott's, noted that this injury was the turning point in Scott's life, as he seemed to have lost his conscience following that incident. After being discharged, Scott joined up with many other victims of Theodore and reported him to the police, where he was charged and sentenced to seven years in prison. Despite getting revenge on the man who had tormented him for over half his life, Scott still felt a sense of guilt and shame for having gone through with it in the first place, and according to people who knew him at the time, he reportedly felt like less of a man. It was also around this time that Scott began his life as a career criminal. He began as a non-violent offender, passing bad checks and running scams to make money. He eventually ended up with several charges and felonies, finding himself in and out of probation and eventually prison by the year 2000. He served a year in jail before he was transferred to a halfway house in 2001 that he escaped from by stealing a truck. Once again, charges were filed against him and a warrant was put out for his arrest. Scott made his way to Alaska, where he posed as his brother in order to hide from authorities. However, his ruse was quickly discovered when he once again began writing fraudulent checks, this time forging $25,000 in checks. He was placed back into prison where he convinced FBI agents that he could work with them to help them solve cases as an informant. Arnold Flowers, a man incarcerated alongside Scott, was working to have a federal judge, prosecutor, and witness involved with his case killed. Scott informed the FBI of this and assisted an undercover agent in stopping Arnold, and in exchange, Scott was transferred to a low-security prison. He then discreetly implied to several agents that he had information on other planned hits like Arnold's and began working with agent Carl Schlaff to stop fellow inmate Steve Ennis, who Scott alleged was planning on killing witnesses related to a trial about Steve's ecstasy distribution ring. Scott informed Carl that he had promised Steve he would kill Steve's witnesses for him after being released. The fake plan Scott had concocted to trick Steve into trusting him was for Steve's girlfriend, a woman named Jennifer Markham, to introduce Scott to Steve's crime partner who would give Scott the gun to kill the witnesses. Scott was released from prison in late 2002, and it was at this point that he began to prepare for three of the four murders he would eventually confess to. The first of these murders was that of Jennifer Markham, the girlfriend of fellow inmate and friend of Scott's, Steve Ennis. Two weeks after his release, Scott began meeting up with Jennifer in order to go through with the fake plan of murdering witnesses for Steve. In February of 2003, Jennifer informed her boyfriend that she would be meeting up with Scott for dinner. This would be the last time anyone other than Scott ever heard from Jennifer. Scott told Carl that Jennifer called him after they finished dinner and told him that she would be going to New York for a while. However, at a later date, Carl noticed that both Scott and Jennifer's phones, which were normally very active, had not been used the day after the dinner. In fact, Steve wouldn't begin using his phone for another three days and Jennifer would never use hers again. Jennifer was presumed missing until two months later when Carl asked Scott if he had any information about Jennifer's location and Scott casually replied that she was dead. However, he wouldn't give any more information than that. Scott was arrested for unrelated charges later that month and was informed by Carl that the FBI would no longer be using him as an informant. In a fit of depression, Scott pleaded with Carl and told him that Jason Price, Scott Ennis's drug partner, had confessed to the murder and even shown Scott photos of Jennifer's body. DEA agent Suzanne Halonen also heard this story and was not inclined to believe, stating that she believed Scott was responsible for Jennifer's murder. With no evidence to prove Scott guilty, the case soon went cold. Jennifer's parents learned of Scott's involvement with the case in 2004 and contacted him for information. 
The three met for dinner where Scott promised them information in exchange for being able to tie up Jennifer's mother and have sex with her. She promptly declined and the two made up their minds that she was responsible for the death of their daughter. Back when Scott had first started working with Carl and the FBI in 2002, he had informed them of a plan to escape from inmate Steve Hawley. What Scott neglected to mention was that he was the one who had concocted the plan with Hawley, which involved Scott coming back to the prison after his release and busting a hole into the prison wall with his truck. Similarly to his plan with Steve Ennis, Scott was also to meet up with Hawley's girlfriend, a woman by the name of Leanne Emery. Leanne eventually started helping Scott with his scams and fraudulent checks, and the two eventually got closer and closer. In late January of 2003, Leanne traveled through different western states with Scott while racking up a total of $15,000 in stolen checks. On January 27th, Leanne called her parents to lie and tell them that she was staying in Mexico. This was the last time they ever heard from her. According to records of her credit card charges, Leanne was in Denver, Colorado at the time and had a two-hour long phone conversation with her cousin where she said that if Scott knew the two of them were talking, then he would murder both of them. According to Scott's later confession, the two of them drove to Bryson Canyon in Utah, where he then ordered her to take off her clothes and kneel on the rocks before shooting her in the head with a handgun. Also in January of the same year, Scott met a woman named Lori McLeod at a casino in Denver. The two got to know each other, and Scott informed Lori that he was an FBI agent before showing her a fake badge and laptop with the FBI's seal. Lori easily accepted this ruse and let Scott into her life, where he learned about her 19-year-old daughter, Casey who was going through a rough time. Although she was on the road to recovery, Casey had a history of fraud, running away, and a previous meth addiction. During August of 2003, Scott went away on what he told Lori was a hunting trip, and Casey disappeared. According to her mother, the police refused to investigate since she was an adult who was free to disappear if she wanted to, and when Scott learned of Casey's disappearance, he told her the same thing. However, he promised to use his FBI contacts to help get information on her. Lori investigated her daughter's disappearance on her own, and eventually was able to get into contact with Casey's boyfriend, who had disappeared alongside Casey. According to him, Casey was last seen being picked up from the motel the two were hiding out at by Scott. Casey's trail soon went cold after this, and Lori and Scott eventually got married in Vegas before taking their honeymoon as a camping trip, where they traveled to the Kremlin area, very near to where Casey's remains were found years later. During 2004, Scott's uncle Terry came to stay with the newlyweds, much to Lori's chagrin. Luckily for Lori, she wouldn't have to worry about her unwanted house guest for long. She came back home from work one day only to find that Terry was gone and the furniture in their home had been rearranged. According to her husband, Terry had won the lottery and had moved to Mexico with a stripper. Having a shred of common sense, Lori suspected Scott was lying, but was relieved to have Terry out of the house, ignorant of the terrible fate that had befallen him. Scott and Lori's marriage soon began to crumble, and eventually, he moved out of the house and rented a place in Lafayette. In early 2006, he got caught in another scam and was eventually tailed by police. Scott led them 260 miles into the town of Mecca, where he eventually ran out of gas before surrendering to the authorities. After his arrest, Scott was sent back to Montana to serve time for the halfway house he had run from so many years prior. This landed him two years in prison, along with an additional 16 months due to some weapon charges. This gave police time to build a murder case against him, which only solidified in April of 2007 when the skull of Casey McLeod was found confirming her death. Leveraging this information against Scott, he agreed to a plea deal. He would reveal the location of his other victims' bodies, and in exchange, he would be charged with one count of murder and be able to avoid a possible death penalty. Scott only ever led investigators to the body of Leanne and Terry, meaning the plea deal was off. Scott still pled guilty to all four murders and was sentenced to 70 years, which, as of this video, he is still currently serving. Scott has given multiple reasons for his murders, many of which contradict each other, all of which go on to prove that until the very end, Scott Lee Kimball is a criminal and liar who only cares about his own well-being at the cost of everyone around him. Let us know your thoughts about this case down in the comment section below, and let us know about any other cases you would like us to cover. If you enjoyed this video, then consider hitting that like button, subscribing, and ringing the bell to get notified whenever we upload another video just like this one, and we'll see you in the next one.